what a great way to start this idea of thinking about the future of Nebraska and, and having somebody that technically thinks outside the box compared to how many of us think about teaching. Because we, we're in our classrooms, the box. And, and go about our business. And so um, Elizabeth is actually going to kind of challenge the group um, to kind of to set the stage for uh, thinking about the future of Nebraska science. <laughs> well, thanks for having me. And I'm, I am one who loves to challenge. And those who do know me in here know I always have crazy ideas and out there ideas and stuff. So this was pretty exciting when uh, Krista called me up. And I'm like, oh, I can challenge people. But I started thinking about it and um, started thinking about when I was a classroom teacher, well, even before that, when I was a field biologist doing work, and then going into the classroom and doing work, and now being at an informal science organization and then working um, nationally with informal science across um, with several different boards and stuff. And I started, um, and working with some of the school districts and stuff like that, and I'm like, wow, there's all kinds of challenges out there. And I had to start focusing in on some key things that, that I have been seeing as a trend across the nation and stuff, and, and trying to bring it back to um, some of the stuff that's going on here in Nebraska. And now, these challenges that I give to you, I know I've talked to other people in this room have heard me talk about these challenges and have seen us imp implement some of these programs at, at several different science organizations, and a lot of people are like, oh, we can't do it here. Before I start in, I wanted to say there are a lot of resources in Nebraska. There's a lot of people that have expertise that are willing to work with you and start making these uh, challenges or these things a reality in your classroom um, with your pre-service teachers, with your grad students, and et cetera, and your school administrators and stuff like that. Um, so I just want to throw it out there that I'm challenging you to challenge me, too, as we're doing this. But so the challenge is to give students and teachers real-world STEM experiences. And I really kind of thought about this. You know, we're trying to give our students STEM experiences and, and uh, preparing them for the future, future workforce, careers, and stuff like that. But we're also realizing and seeing that a lot of our teachers, they know, they can see a, a STEM activity in the textbook, but don't have that background experience. They don't have those experiences that we're trying to give our kids to build upon. They don't have those experiences, so they really don't have the passion, and they don't know how to apply this in the classroom. And that's only trying to get people out and about to get these experiences. And so I, at, through the years, like I said, I was blessed to have been outside the classroom and doing field work. And so I remember as a classroom teacher, I would bring all that knowledge and apply that in the classroom, and it just caused a buzz in that classroom. So that's kind of the challenge. So I'm going to show you some different examples that you can do this with little ones, all the way to big ones, and you know we can talk about it in the room. But here's a really incredible example. Um, some of you know that we have a high school at the zoo, and it's junior and senior year. And we have a math teacher on staff, we have a, um, two science teachers on staff, social studies teacher, and English teacher on staff. And this program is not for the top of the top students, um, but it's a partnership with OPS and Papillion La Vista. Actually, the kids that we have, we have several kids with um, IEPs that have D averages throughout school. And that's the majority of the group, and we do have some that are top of the top. So we have a whole array of kids, and we see these kids leaving the program with B's and A's and actually going off to the universities um, and taking science courses. But this is an example of a, of a project that all four teachers came together and started working on. And this was a math lesson. The math teacher brought this up. And so she did some research about spiders and spider webs. So the kids had to go out and do this research with the English teacher, find out, and the science teacher find out about spiders, go out. Of course, we had the zoo that they can go and look at spiders, but this is something you can look at in your classroom, up in the corner or outside kind of thing. They did science observations of spiders creating webs, so they were recording and analyzing these spider webs being made. The math part is what she was focusing on, 
She introduced the concepts, geometric um, configurations, and calculations, and she used this in her pre-calc class and her Algebra 2 class and geometry for different equations, and they had to devise the equation and calculate the equation of these spider webs. And then they had to take their calculations that they think are correct for these spider webs and then create their own spider web. And then finally, they had to, of course, look at spiders and how it relates to modern life. Um, so how is science using spider web technology? Um, even the, threads, the, the threads and the, the silk of spiders, how tough it is. They found out that if they have um, about a nickel size thing of uh, spider web and pull it across, you can bring down a large um, airplane from the sky. If you put this nice thread across the, that's, so it's pretty cool. It's in bullet, bullet um, they're looking at um, bulletproof uh, vests for spider webs because it's so strong. So these kids found out all this information and then they presented their findings and calculation and web design. So that's something that can be implemented in the classroom um, simply and it's taking all those concepts. Now they hit major major pieces for the test. I hear that all the time. You have to teach the test. Well they're, they're teaching and they're preparing the kids for the test, but they're not teaching to the test. They're taking and applying the knowledge and really learning it. Okay, so that's one of your challenges. <laughs> um, another one, this is for little kids, and I won't go through each step, but they ha um, these are kids that are becoming scientists and collecting data on sea turtles. So they had to learn about sea turtles. The problems with sea turtles with uh, the light pollution on the beaches and messing up their nesting, um, the technology part of it is they're tracking these turtles. It's free, easy, get on the internet, and the kids can see the tracking and map out the migration of some of these turtles. But then they had to design ways to decrease the light pollution. And we're talking, um, we've done this with um, second graders all the way up to fourth and fifth and sixth graders and stuff. So these are some easy things that we can incorporate in to the curriculum lesson. And this is something, like I said, there's a lot of resources, a lot of people out there that can help you out with putting these things together. Okay, writing in, in science. Um, they hear that a lot, reading and writing in science. We have to focus on the math and reading and writing. Well, we have pre-K students that are doing journals. There's a lot of research and data out there that shows to start with the little pre-K kids with developing those scientific skills. Even if they're coloring pictures in their journals, or using little pieces to look at, um, to design their journals or what they're observing. Um, kindergarten kids, uh, journaling, the letter G. This is our kindergarten class. Um, they learn the alphabet, they're learning how to write, they're going out and making observations and they're coloring and then, uh, you can't see it, but they have their kindergarten handwriting and their kindergarten sounding out words and stuff, so they're learning that whole process of journaling. And then of course teachers, learning how to develop questions and scientific observations and stuff like that. Okay, so it really is easy, but it, it really takes knowing and understanding and gaining those experiences so you, you know how to apply some of this into the classroom and it also for the administrators to understand. And so some ways, and I know um, some school districts are doing this, but they're incorporating um, science challenges and experiences right into their curriculum. So much of that whole spider web, but they're taking these challenges and incorporating it right into their curriculum. I know Omaha Public School uses a lot of the Science Olympiad um, competition activities and incorporate that right into the curriculum um, because those are real world application kind of experiences developing and stuff. Um, designing experiments, um, there's an opportunity and we'll show it in a second that kids can de design experiments and send them up on the, the balloon watches and stuff and the Strategic Air and Space Museum and then on the Nebraska NASA Grant is helping that out, and I talked to uh, Strategic Air and Space yesterday and asked, "Can I showcase your stuff?" And they're like, "Oh yeah, please do." And they said they would go out to anywhere in Nebraska and do these balloon launches. So that's something that is easily available. It's not just for 
certain areas. Robotic competitions, uh, a big one for uh, the nature of science and learning about science are your regional science fairs and state science fairs. I know there's several different regions in Nebraska, but incorporating that right into the curriculum piece of it. Uh, so here's a, applying that scientific knowledge creates excitement for the students and makes it more meaningful. We all love it when we see the kids with their eyes sparkling because they get it and they get all excited and stuff like that. That's one thing that drives me to keep doing what I do. But you can see the kids um, designing their experiment, getting ready to launch it. Chris, you can tell me if I'm doing this right. It goes up and the kids will get actual footage of what it looks like with their experiments going up and then they're excited when they get to find their experiments. They get to track it down and stuff. So just creating experiences like that. Um, this is a big one, immersing teachers and students into real world problems and experiences. And we kind of talked about that. A lot of times teachers will, and I used to do this too, would just kind of look at the textbook example of a real world problem experience but not having background information at all. But we start giving them experiences and you can gain these experiences at all ages. Here we have, we, we do this a lot at our organization. We are begging people to come up and ask us to do stuff so we can give experiences to students. Our kindergartners, if you've been through the renovated aquarium, they spent um, the whole kindergarten year designing the interactive kids coral reef area. And they were given a problem, they had to investigate and study and learn, they did drawings, and then they sat and presented it to our director of the zoo, their stories, and we took all the little um, pieces and components, and then they were invited back to the opening before, before it opened up. So giving them those real world experiences. And those kids keep talking about it and they keep coming back, and some of them want to be architects, some of them want to be engineers now, some want to be scientists. Um, same thing up there is having kids involved in strategic planning and, um, and stuff like that. So. So there's a lot that you can do. Um, once again, uh, these experiences can be right there in the yard, um, immersive field studies, or teachers and students learning together. We really like to see and give opportunities like that, where the, the teachers and the students are learning together how to do this, and they're going through the problems together. Um, now we can get really fancy. And this is a program that we started, and I know this program, we have several models across the country, is taking teachers, we also do students too, but taking teachers and immerse, immersing them into fields. I know there's a lot of programs where you can go to the university and work in lab settings and stuff like that, but we're actually taking them out of the country, or even in what, uh, Western Nebraska with some of our researchers, and we're having them actively out there collecting data um, for field projects that are going on. So this is one um, from Costa Rica, and we were actually going out and measuring trees that could be potential um, nesting trees for green macaws. And that data, those scientists are using that data. Um, then we, if the teachers learn how to collect that data, they learn. They come back, we craft it, we look at it, and they do all kinds of different pieces that they can implement. What was really cool about this trip, and people have heard me say this before, we had a teacher with us who had been teaching um, biology for 30 some years, uh, rainforest. He went on this trip with us, and he came up to me, and I get goosebumps every time I talk about this. He said, I have done a disservice for 30 years. I have not taught about the rainforest correctly. Now I know what the rainforest is. I know what it smells like, feels like, touch. I can, I can talk about that rainforest now. And so that's what kind of drives us, is try to get those experiences, whether it's right there in your backyard, at your, you know, us coming to your school, you're in your classroom, outside in the, around the school, or taking you out of the country kind of thing. Um, because of that, we built this program and we we're working with a grant right now and um, setting up the program in South Africa to work with some of our researchers in South Africa and some of the zoos in South Africa. And we're continuing to take teachers. We've taken them to Baja, Mexico. I think we're going up to Alaska this summer. 
and just to kind of immerse them in. And while they're there, part of their job is they have to look at the curriculum, we talk to them, and then have to write lessons that they can bring back and incorporate into the classroom. I was talking to a teacher this morning, and she went to Galapagos. She said that was, she now is talking about Galapagos, she has more experience, and they're doing all kinds of new types of lessons and stuff to incorporate that are real world problems that are occurring. Um, so content knowledge is going on, and I know my time's going, going fast, but um, working with STEM professionals. You have a picture of working with one of our keepers, but there's tons of professionals out there. Call them, contact them, and seriously, if they, I have no problem calling and contacting them with you. If <laughs> they say, you know, I'll call them up and say, you guys are missing out here. So I have no problem, I've done that several times too, but, but get them, um, go to their field. Go, if you can go to where they're working, that's great. Or when they do come in, uh, lectures are fine, but that's kind of boring. Have them do something interactive, something that they actually do, or bring tools that they work on. Um, students, once again, you see the picture. Applying knowledge creates and understands concepts. Out there with some other collections. Um, actively involving students in the field or laboratory studies, same thing with teachers. Getting them out there. So, so the challenge is to really figure out how to give students some of these experiences, but how to give pre-service teachers experiences, how to give teachers experiences and yourself experiences so that you can help um, put some of these uh, real world experiences and passion into that curriculum for application. Um, engaging experiences help STEM careers in the future. Um, the bottom one, we had a student that went through the program when it first started 16 years ago, and she's a vet tech. Um, and you can see her working on a cat. Um, we have another student who, um, she decided uh, from all her experiences with careers that she is doing research now. Then we have others that decided, hey, you know what, maybe I want to do engineering or architect. So we're, we're seeing these kids through their experiences start. Going, going out and doing all kinds of impressive things. So, the challenge, that's your challenge. Any questions or anything? Is there a particular place? How do we hook into some of the programs you're talking about? Um, and that, you know, that's a, that's a challenge too. And that's what we are talking about, that challenge. Um, there's several, and I can look at, there's several, you know, um, museums across the state of Nebraska that all do all kinds of different projects and that's why I was trying to, to show that it's not only the zoo that's out there doing this stuff because it's always a zoo person talking about zoo stuff but you contacting those education departments um, if you contact if you start those museums institutes contact them um, uh, Game and Parks is here, Extension is here. If you contact them and start really investigating and asking them who's out doing research on invasive species kind of thing and see if you can work with some of those individuals. I know like uh, even the university, some of their laboratories like microbiology lab, I know it's worked with students in the past. Um, and that's something, you know, we're, I was talking this morning, that's a challenge for us. I really think it's time that we have this kind of resource up on that science matter and a database, because I know a moral hall, I keep pointing at you guys, is doing all kinds of stuff. And they have kids um, coming in and doing some work, too, with the paleontology. When we did our JIG site, we were sending kids to moral hall to do some work there, too. Um, so I'm throwing a challenge out at you, but I also know there's a challenge on this end, and I'm more than happy if you email to try to direct you in some of the right directions for these challenges. Um, another thing is, is money is a challenge, and so we are happy to partner on grants. or some grants that, as informal science organizations, we can't go after, but there's some other grants we can. So if we know you have a project, it's something that we always have an out, we always are looking out for and trying to find funds and stuff for that. Um, so yeah, so there's a challenge that's back at us. So I think that's part of the, the issue too, is just simply out lack of a network of communication that exists. I mean, even doing the, the STA, you know, version of the connection and stuff, and that still doesn't contact all the people yeah. who can contact it. 
just as you just indicated, there's all sorts of amazing resources out there that people are simply unaware of. Yes, exactly. So and that, that's that network is weak. It is very weak, and I know um, Sherry and I had that discussion this morning, and they, they all told me that, okay, Elizabeth, you're done with your doctor, you're done with this. Uh, here's a new thing for you to finally find your plate. And I know that I have other museum people in here with me right now that I think they're about ready to get it out. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you very much. Yeah. Thanks.